Well, good. We got some more people showing up. I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, I do have 1230 here on my clock. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm BK, uh, the director of the Maintenance Institute here at the Pennsylvania Recreation and Park Society. Uh, welcome to our second maintenance roundtable for 2023. Uh, again, roundtables are very free flow. This is definitely not a webinar, uh, and it is very important that you contribute and take part so that we all can gain value from this conversation. It's rather open. Uh, I want this to be valuable to you. So questions, topics, things that you want to cover. Um, that's really the focus of this. But I kind of scripted the day to think around sustainability as our primary focus of discussion. And that, uh, that could be whatever your interpretation is of sustainability, because the more research I dig at this, that's not just recycling programs. You know, we need to think of sustainability on a community level. And so when we look at resilient communities and we take that to a higher level, a different concept, now we're looking at things more than just infrastructure and how it's a social aspects and different things that we all have play in. Um, we create sense of space by the work that we do. So the things and the contributions that we put out there uh, really are contributing to that resilience of our communities at large. Um, and so that's kind of how I would like us to think about general discussion. You know, it's not meant to be, to be bitch sessions. Sometimes we can frustrate and, you know, have a good time with that, but it is meant to be uh, more appreciative and sharing some of the either common challenges that we may find or common solutions that we find work best in certain situations. So I want to open it up, um, kind of see what you guys have interest in when you think about that term sustainability or resilience, you know, what do those things mean and how does that contribute to, to your goal for being here today. I guess I can I can get started. Um, Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me turn my camera on. Uh, Ron Rudisill, I'm the Chief of Park Maintenance and Turf Management for Baltimore City Recreation and Parks. So uh, part of the sustainability challenges that I'm having is one is personnel. Uh, the second thing is, you know, because our procurement process is a little different than other cities, it takes forever to uh, get equipment that we need to be productive as we can be, right? Um, it's not about not having the money uh, because we do. It just takes forever um, to get what we need, uh, so that we, like I said, so that we can get things done. But uh, you know, my challenge now is just uh, finding uh, employees who want to work and want to work in this type of field. Um, because I think because of the pandemic, it just changed so many people's view of what work looks like and feels like and is to them um, because you have so many people that, that come in and they just don't know or don't understand or have a, a knowledge of what they're getting into. Um, <laughs> um, but it, it, that has been our, our biggest challenge is, is just finding uh, people who really wanna work. It's not that the jobs are not out there and they're not available. It's just that, uh, you know, people are not ready to come back to work. Even at this point, it's, it's still a, a, a big challenge. Um, and like I said, when they do get in, they just don't have the, the basic skill sets or knowledge of the job to be um, an asset for 
recreational parks starting out. Not that they can't do it. It's just that they're not coming in with any skills whatsoever. Um, you, you will be amazed at uh, some of the young men, men and women who have uh, come in and they don't know how to use a rake or a shovel or a lawnmower. And it's, it's mind blowing to me, right? Because, you know, I started using that stuff when I was seven, eight years old, you know? I was out cutting the grass or cutting somebody's lawn in the in the in the in the neighborhood, all that kind of stuff. So it, it's it's um it's a you have to adapt to where people are <laughs> with, with certain things. Um, but like I say, it, it's it's a challenge. Um, so hopefully, you know, as things really start to get to move forward, uh, you know, that challenge will kind of balance itself out. Hopefully. But right now, it's it's a, a big challenge with us trying to find, you know, good people to come in and, and uh, really take ownership to their job and what they, they have to do. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting space. You're talking almost just sustainability of your own program and kind of worried about, okay, all these other things aside, we just got to keep things running. That, that's a whole different level. Yeah, and, yeah. And we could spend hours on that conversation, I'm sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess opening it up at the, the at the risk of, well, I mean, it's the point of the conversation. So, I mean, is that something that you are finding as well in your shops that it's the 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 forward thinking of, well, what if X Y Z person disappears? What are we going to do? Justin, I see you kind of nodding your head, but I don't have an answer. <laughs> yeah, like we're in a small borough, so we only have uh, five full-time guys in our department. And we used to get summer help kids to help out with the grass cutting and the usually uh, high school or college kids. In the past couple of years, we've had zero applicants. Um, the, the, borough, the borough has increased the pay rate for the summer summer program and uh still very little applicants or any interest um I'm, I'm curious how many guys in baltimore are on your parks and rec crew what uh, a big city like that how many guys do you employ to to keep the city clean and and operating well from the from the park maintenance side uh i have uh around 60, 65, but you're talking about five districts and you're talking about one district having over, you know, well over a thousand acres to maintain a park. Wow. Land. So you're talking about not just, we have a contractor that, that cuts out grass now, okay. um, but you're talking about pavilions and park benches and basketball courts and all that kind of stuff. So. We have, still have to keep that maintained. So, and and most of the yards, say for um, Drew Hill District, they are 16, 16 to 17 um, employees there. And it's 10 that are full-time. And that's including the park district manager. So you have a park district manager, an assistant, a park maintenance supervisor, then you have the laboring force, right? So right. that's even less. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's still nowhere near what we would need to be, you know, as productive. But, you know, we still make things happen because um, I, I do have a, um, a really good crew, um, you know, the managers and a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, other people that have been here for a while, for, you know, 20 years, 15, you know, some 30 so they they know what they're doing and they like I said they've been here for a while so that that helps having an internal knowledge with how things should get done and the way it should look and all that kind of stuff so yeah we we still don't have enough people <laughs> like it should be i mean years ago it was 100 people at each yard so that was that was just 500 people working in the maintenance yards by itself that's not including horticulture and 
forestry and the other divisions within park maintenance. Wow. That's, that's yeah. huge. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got a lot on your plate there. A absolutely. Yeah. Y'all look great hair, man. You see all the great? Hey, look, I, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I look like BK. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I get it. <laughs> well, I'm curious as an answer to some of the shortages of staff and things, have some folks started looking at things in that sustainable realm of, you know, cutting back on the amount that you are mowing or you need to mow and maybe redesigning some of your operations around the fact that you just shorthanded. And so therefore you either change your, uh, your, your, Pest thresholds, or you change your standards of care at all? Right? Anybody? Yeah, well, you to you have that? to be creative in in how you operate when you don't have enough people. So there are certain tasks that you just can't get to. Um, so you have to prioritize. You know what's important and kind of just go down the list. Um, because I, I don't know if you guys know a lot about Baltimore, but Baltimore is a, a very political place. <laughs> and uh, but it, it's it's there, there are challenges, but there are challenges that we can't overcome. Right. But like I said, it's just about, you know, you being creative and and, and a manager's being creative in, in the task and how they're getting things done, how they're deploying the crews. You know what type of tasks need to get done right now other ones can wait a week or two or you know what you can do in overtime or you know so you you just have to think outside of the box and then think outside of that box right so the, the more creative you are in how you your operation is is very beneficial even a big operation like baltimore city you have to be creative because if you, if you just try to stay in that box and keep everything the same, you're going to drive yourself crazy. You're going to drive your employees crazy. So you, you have to be creative and you have to, um, you know, give them the freedom to be creative in their space. Right. And that helps take a lot of the pressure off of, you know, the managers and higher ups and everybody. So you have to allow people that room to be able to do those things. But yeah, it, it is a challenge, but it, it's it's nothing that we can't overcome. Steve, what do you got? I, well, I just had a question. I just wanted to see how everybody else does it, like recruiting the seasonal work, like for the um, for teenagers. Do you guys go into the high schools and ask? Do you like throw the word out on the website, or how, how do you guys recruit for like the summer seasonal help? Yeah, I believe uh, the the boroughs. Um, yeah, I think there is yeah. a local school that we reach out to. School that we reach out to. I don't know. We don't get much much uh, much uh, support from that, or or much results from that. Result. Uh, 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 other employees like kids sometimes apply. We, uh, hire some. Other employees from other departments. Some of their kids will come in for the summer, um, but it's mostly uh, website. Uh, maybe some of the the uh, job search websites as well. But uh, yeah, it's been since the pandemic. It's been it's been tough getting the yeah. summer help that we need to to keep the parks clean and and operating. Do you, do you guys give them more if they came back for like a second year? Yeah, there's a. a a, sl a slight increase of, I don't know if it's 75 cents or a dollar if you come back. It's not even. Not even. Not even. Yeah. It's not much, but yeah, there is a, a little reward for coming back the, the next summer. Any referral bonuses for the kids too? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm that's, that's, that's something that probably, that's probably something that we should probably look into. That would probably help. It's yeah. a good idea. Provided they work for three months or whatever it is, you know, like you work a full 75 days, you get an additional 200 at the end or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's, 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 that's good thinking. That's something we'll have to uh, think about. Tom. Yes, sir. Hey, we are in the same boat. We're in the same boat as the other guys. Um, we're a small city, you know, 23,000. 
Um, our maintenance crew is five full time um, out in the parks, one in our building. But just listening, you know, we tried years ago to do the um, the summertime hiring students. Um, and when I got here eight years ago, we didn't even have a lawnmower. Um, we c- contracted it out to t- take care of all of our fields and we take care of all of our parks. We have 17 park spaces. We have athletic fields. Um, we also take care of the high school fields. Um, as far as, you know, ball games and everything, we have an agreement with the schools, but, um, we just started, I started buying a couple of years ago, the end of the fiscal year, buying zero turn mowers. And we had some people who, you know, for whatever reason, they didn't never knew how to push them on more, drive a lawn more. So now I have a maintenance crew who all can drive zero turn. They all can weed eat. They can all mow. Um, I have a, uh, I had two retirees in the last couple of years and we got some young people in here um, and they're great. Uh, I think our staff is one of the best we have around. Um, instead of relying, when we ran into shortfalls with money a couple of years ago, instead of relying on the uh, mowing contractors to take care of everything, uh, I would tell the mowing contractor, hey, I need to save some money. So I'd send my crew out one day and we'd you know, do five or six of our parks and save three or $400. Um, and so, you know, this time of year, high school sports are ending. Um, we have little league and stuff going on, but when we have some downtime, uh, they'll go out and mow and they'll take care of stuff like that. So we don't have any high school, um, employees. That'd be great. I have one person who's in college who does my weekends on my parks, but other than that, it's just my full-time staff and they're phenomenal right now. I feel blessed that I can just say, this is what we need to get done. And They've done some, they've built trails in the off season. They've done all kinds of stuff. So they have all kinds of, um, you know, skill sets. And it's unfortunate in our town, you know, we like everybody else, you know, they want more money. And a couple of years ago, our public works were given massive raises because they're out in the field and everything. And my guys didn't miss a day during the pandemic. You know, we're during the pandemic. You can't, um, you know, who's going to pick up the trash? Well, our guys did. So they couldn't work virtually. So they worked every single day and they're like, hey, how come public works is getting all these raises and we're not? And, you know, we, our new director has done a great job um, and she's actually on here of helping our staff out and giving them everything we can. But it's tough to justify when you're in the same yard as a public works, we're doing the same stuff as they are. They just went and got this huge raise and my guys are like, what's going on? And they have sucked it up and have done a great job. And you know, we have complaints here and there, but I, it's justifiable. I'm like, yeah, I understand what you guys are saying. We're doing everything we can to help you out. So um, it's like everywhere, though. Um, you know, everywhere's fighting the financial issue. And uh, we just feel blessed here that our, our staff does a great job. So um, I feel you guys, you know, without the money and without the staff trying to get new people in. Um, we had a young lady who started for us a little over a year ago. And we didn't have anybody on staff as a female. She's phenomenal. She is better mechanic, a better mower, a better everything than half of my guys. And she'll jump in and do it in a heartbeat and change the oil on the mowers. And she'll tell them things that needs to be done. So we're just blessed that um, we get people like that that come out here full time um, to work. So uh, I feel lucky in that situation. Seth, Tabitha, you have anything you'd like to add or? Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. No, I think I think Tom covered us very well. Thank you so much. Uh, Seth, you're muted. I think you might be in the same room as Justin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why we were getting an echo from you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Step out in another room. No. Were you going to say something, Seth, or you're good? You're muted, though. Yeah. You got to unmute your. I have a question, BK, when you get to it, how many people um, contract out their mowing? Uh, does everybody contract it out, or does a lot of people do it in-house now? Um, I know localities near us, they all do it in-house, and they only have one or two or people, but our locality, you know, we've asked for years to give us $50,000, I'll hire two people and have full time and we'll take care of everything. But no, we spend $50,000 on a contractor who 
frankly does a shitty job, you know. Oh. So I, I just want to see what everybody else is feeling. So what I was going to say earlier is when I worked for a previous township, I don't know how they got away with it, but they actually did their summer help as a college internship. And it was a paid internship, but we ended up actually getting guys coming back year after year after year. They were making a decent wage. It was a little bit over like what you could find everywhere else, but we had higher expectations from them. And it actually seemed to work out very well with, like you guys said, the incentives of coming back every year, plus the quality of work that you're going to get from them every year. And it like, people don't want to look at that. Oh, well, they cost $2 more than a kid from high school, but these guys are going for the internship as well. I mean, it, that was important to those guys. Well, I would say you see a lot of that, especially in the programming realm, um, you know, summer camps and things. There's a lot of those paid positions going and in the event management kind of things on the operations side. You definitely it, it's something that we should, in, in my suggestion, as a best practice, follow what some of those folks do. They do that. In the, so you have those referrals at the end of the season. Hey, if you get. For every person that you get to come back next year and work for us, you get 50 bucks or 100 bucks or a gift card or something. And then that way it, it incentivizes your good people to get people to come in and then say, hey, if you can get somebody, you know, it's that uh, chain letter kind of concept, if you will. You know, so you get everybody to play along. And so that way you're getting a better crop because you already know you're getting good recommendations and they don't want to put their neck on the line because then they're not going to get their job kind of moving forward. And you see that in the aquatics as well, especially on the on the returning, you get an incentive at least you come back another season, we give you a quarter, a 50 cents, a dollar, whatever that is within your budget range. But you also, when you're doing those kind of things, when I was in higher education, you had to worry about compression because now all of your part-time staff are making pretty close to what your full-time staff are. But, you know, and so you really start getting some of that grief. And so you, there's gives and takes that you have to put into account. And one thing when you think about contracting out, yeah, sometimes it may cost a little bit more, but you're not paying 30% extra for benefits. And so that's a big thing that you need to take into your account when you're doing your costs. And so that's kind of where I go. My question, when we think about financial sustainability a little bit more, what are some of the steps that you've been putting into place that have been helping, not necessarily cut corners, but reprioritize that's the term i've been trying to use more steve well i was going to throw it out there hopefully this is along the lines of what you're saying um but i was just going to ask everybody too like we've toyed around with some fields that aren't used like baseball fields and all the grass that has to get cut we've toyed around with making them meadows and stuff where we don't have to mow has anybody done that or use that as an option mm -hmm. yes it, does it does it work? Uh, is it more work like doing it, but in the long run, it, it's beneficial, more beneficial? Uh, I'd say it saves us some time on mowing, definitely. But we also get some complaints from like uh, houses that back up to that property. Yeah. Rodents and, and insects and stuff like that living in the meadow. So some people are for it. Some are against it. So it's it's tricky. Um, but it, it definitely saves us time in, in the grass cutting, okay. which gives us time to do other other maintenance activities. Um, but yeah, it's it's some are for it and some aren't. So yeah, it was one of the most frequent choices for municipalities, at least here in Pennsylvania when the pandemic hit and people were getting furloughed. And so they're like, oh, we'll just no mo, you know, but there is right ways and wrong ways to create a meadow. Just stop mowing is not a way to create a meadow. <laughs> That's a way to create a hot mess, especially if you have any kind of invasives yes. anywhere near there. And there's invasives everywhere, you know, yeah. so it can become a complete nightmare. We've seen examples 
I won't say the municipality, but outside of the Philadelphia area where they decided to turn a golf course into a meadow and they eventually turned that meadow back into a golf course area because of what happened, you know? So it's not just stop mowing. Right. And it's yeah. low mo. It's really no such thing as no mo. Yeah. Even a meadow, you're going to have to either burn it down or cut it down at some point so it can regenerate. Sure. Well, yeah, yep. that's what I was going to ask too about like if they put new plantings there, like what it would be or what would work best. I guess I know it's going to be regional, but you know, in, in the meadows, is that something you, you might have, VK, or just try to reach out to? The very, my, I mean, I don't know what you guys did when you established them, but I always say go to your local land grant school, no matter what state you're in, okay. go to your land grant. So in Pennsylvania here, it's Penn State, you know, New Jersey, it's Rutgers, you go to Cornell up in New York, Mary, you know, I, so I know the regional ones around us, but that's the recommendation because they're federally funded. So anything yeah. recommendation wise, getting people to come out and support you is not going to cost you a dime. You already paid for it. Yeah, we got yeah, them Penn State's the way for us to go. Then. Okay. Thanks. What did you guys do, Justin, Seth, or, or uh, were you not part of that process? Uh, that was our, our old director came up with that idea and we just let it grow. So it wasn't a, a true meadow. It was just weeds that were waist high. And it was, wasn't very attractive. And a lot of the uh, neighboring houses complained about their nice manicured field now being waist high weeds. And that's the other recommendation I've come that. across is you really need to educate the stakeholders and have the stakeholders involved in the process, not just we're turning this area into a meadow. You know, it, it's... Uh, Otherwise, you will get those examples. Yeah. Yeah, we did that with one of our parks. We abandoned the park, for lack of a better word. And my staff continues to take care of it. And it actually looks better now than it did when it was a park, uh, just because we maintain it. Um, the basketball courts were really falling apart. We took all the fencing down, all the goals and everything. So there's just a blacktop area now and a big open field where before it was a softball field and it had benches and stuff, but it wasn't very well maintained. It's in a not so friendly neighborhood. And my staff just goes in and mows it once every couple of weeks and it keeps it well maintained. And it looks better now than it did eight years ago. Um, and that was a park back then. So it kind of just depends on where you're at. Um, our old director wanted us to do exactly what you're talking about. Um, he said, oh, let's take care of this place here. Let's just plant wildflowers here. And we were like, uh, that's not going to go over well if you just take a big open area and plant wildflowers to save 30 minutes of mowing as opposed to having to deal with all this stuff. So we decided not to go that way in, in certain areas. Um, and I think it was a good decision because, you know, we all know flowers don't grow like you want them to all the time. So sometimes it's more of a hassle than it is to deal with. So. You know, in a perfect world, if you want, oh, yeah, there's a picture. This is what it's going to look like. Uh, not so much. It doesn't really work out that way all the time. And thinking financial sustainability, I guess it depends on what the opportunities are, the money buckets around you. You know, in Pennsylvania right now, there are a lot of turf reduction grants out there. So if you have areas that are at least a half an acre and you're willing to put in the time and things like that, there's money out there for those projects, you know, through the Bureau of Forestry or uh, you know, DEP, a lot of water support money around these kind of projects, riparian buffer. I'm sure you've heard that buzz term out there. You know, it's basically done well. They're lower maintenance areas, nice trees, things like that. Uh, done improperly, it's a tree graveyard, you know, just nothing but empty tree tubes. Uh, so there, it's out there, the, the, but it is, nothing is a free lunch. So those, nothing is maintenance free, as we're finding, or you may have learned, or hopefully you know. Um, I want to touch on something, another kind of sustainability community aspect of food security. I'm curious if any of your 
uh, operations or any of your projects have been uh, integrated a little bit more with supporting the community, especially either feeding. We've seen this since uh, the pandemic, where basically since the schools were closed, the recreation facilities became the only way that food was getting out to because the schools were fading them, you know. So what kind of transitions have you found or has anything stuck around maybe more community gardening or repurposing blighted out areas in the communities for these kind of purposes and or, you know, around that circular economy, trying to cut down on the waste and repurposing some of those things in different directions? We uh, we did um, a community garden about four years ago. It was right before the pandemic, and actually one of our stormwater uh, people, she was a master gardener and loved to do that, um, and we put it in one of our parks that's fenced in and is only used for events three or four times a year, and it, it was a great, but she, again, like we are talking about with employees, getting volunteers to help her. She couldn't maintain it herself. And it just flourished. The food was uh, phenomenal, the vegetables and everything. But then the second year with no volunteers, it became way too much for her. Um, and we ended up, you know, just getting rid of it because there was nobody to take care of it. Um, because one of our initiatives in our city was, you know, we're a food desert. There's very, we're, we're at the confluence of the James and the Appomattox River. So we don't have a lot of stores in our town. Uh, you got to go a long ways to get food. So the people who live down there, the rivers, um, they call it a food desert. There's not a lot of places and stores to get food. So they were thinking, oh, let's help the people out. It was a great idea. But if you don't have volunteers, you know, they expect us, oh, we're going to grow this garden and we're going to go get it. But, you know, you got to help maintain it is what it comes down to. So nobody wanted to help maintain it. So it just kind of fell apart. But um, but yeah, we've tried it in a couple different parks doing um you know, raise beds and raise gardens and stuff. Um, and it's just never, never enough people, the idea is there, but nobody wants to help keep it up. So. Similar experiences, different experiences. We, Ron? We had a community yeah, garden. Seth. How, how did it work, Seth? It worked well, I think for a couple of years, but you, the same things, lack of maintenance and it just it ended up unfortunately called parks department you know we had to rent a here to till it up because we didn't have people to take weed management in and basically people we would rototill it they would plant it and came back everything grew and it just to cost costly and um, they voted it out because the numbers being way down right Ron, looked like you were going to say something. Yeah, we, we have the same issue in, in Baltimore City. We have several uh, community gardens uh, throughout the city. And, um, you know, just like everybody else was saying, you know, it, it, it's trying to find people to help maintain them. Um, and with the community gardens in Baltimore City, you can buy a plot for like $25. Uh, it's raised beds and you don't have to worry about water and that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, people are not just getting out, you know, wanting to do that kind of work anymore. So it it becomes a a challenge with, uh, you know, keeping them maintained. They're not directly underneath me. Uh, we have a chief horticulturalist who maintains all the community gardens. But, you know, they, they are inside of our parks. But like I said, they you might have, I mean, there's like 25, 30 at, at most of the community gardens and, you know, plots. And you might have five or six that are being used. And the other ones just have weeds and everything else growing up in them. Um, but at the same time, you know, we still have to uh, make sure that we keep it maintained for a lot of different reasons. Uh, Cause you know, we have issues with homelessness and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, it's tough. <laughs> I'm curious, do you think if if the spots were free, would that make it more or less? You know, I I found that 
I, I community garden here in State College, and I know also there's a very successful urban farming effort going on in Philadelphia as another example, and they use a lot of parks and rec areas, but they also use some of the community, even just blighted out properties that have been converted by the local communities and things. And some of it is that buy-in piece and that, you know, when things are free, you kind of use that concept that no one washes a rental car, you know, but when you actually make them either pay an annual fee or put something in, now there is more buy-in and the, the growth keeps that moving forward and snowballing. Like I have to pay an annual fee. And if I don't keep it up, then I can't come back the next year. And they took my deposit away as well. So that's kind of one of those buy-in kind of things. Now, if you don't care, you don't care. I guess there's always those folks too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I think the, I think it's like maybe 25 a year or something like that. I mean, it's, but like I said, it's just a challenge, um, you know, before that, you know, they will be packed years ago, you know, bustling with people going in and out growing food and giving it to the community and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's just, and I'm sure everybody else can contest to it. It's just people's mindset and, uh, you know, how they are dealing with things is, is different now. Um, why? I, I don't, I don't know. Um, and I'll probably never know. It will probably never know. Right. Cause people are different and, um, you know, different times, people are, their mindsets are just on different things. So the, the challenge is how do we get people back into the parks and helping out in the community and wanting to do these things? That That's the, the challenge. And the challenge is getting the younger people more involved with these type of projects, right? Um, so yeah, ours, ours, like Ron was, um, you know, ours was free and we actually ran classes through our recreation department um, as programs and our master, um, our master gardener, she ran the classes and we were trying to teach people how to do gardens so they could do it on their own at home and stuff. And like I said, you'd have five, six, seven people at the classes and teaching them. But then when it came time to taking care of them, that's when it fell apart. Nobody in those classes wanted accountability they wanted to come and learn and then they go and do their thing and then we have a garden that we have to take care of and nobody's there so you know we we're trying to help the people out and it was free and trying to teach them but again you know like bk said if there's buy-in sometimes even five or ten dollars people take account when you do free stuff they don't feel like they've got anything invested you know so it's catch 22 or it ends up being like a fitness bike in january by March, it's a clothes rack, you know, so um, kind of moving topics a little bit. I, I'm curious, a lot of our time, you know, the th again, we're talking about being conservative with the time that we don't have because we are a little short. Waste management is something that probably consumes the most of your time. When I think of the amount of tasks and looking at the, the scale of operational tasks, what is that one thing that happens year round? It is not seasonal. It's waste management. And so I'm curious, what are some of the kind of uh, efforts have you been doing uh, in your operations or have you been looking at, I, I've been seeing things, well, just get rid of all the trash cans. I'm like, well, they're just going to throw it on the ground. But other people are saying, well, no, this works, you know, carry in, carry out. And I think in certain situations, it could be successful. But I also think humans are humans. And so they're going to make a mess, especially, you know, can we control it? Can we put it in certain areas? And then dog waste versus human waste versus all these other kind of conversations around waste. What are some things that you're finding successes with? I think for, for Baltimore City is just continuously educating people on, on uh, you know, where to put your trash, how to dispose of things. Um, and I think it's a, it's, it'll always be a, a continuous thing because um, we have a, a, a huge problem with illegal dumping in certain areas in Baltimore City. It, it's major. 
Um, so it, it's, it's and you know, we have signage out there. We got, you know, if you get caught, you know, illegal dumping and there's, you know, fines and all that kind of stuff, but people still continue to do it. It's just, I think it's just trying to change people's mindsets. Um, and it, and it, it's a lot, you know, to that. Because if you got a small contractor who's trying to make a couple dollars and they just got some trash from somebody's house that they were trying to renovate, they don't want to take it to the dump because then they got to pay money to get rid of it. So they lose part of their profit, right? The easier thing just to take it somewhere in the woods and dump it. So it's just trying to, like I said, educate people and let them know about the the issues that, you know, the, with the legal dumping can cause in a lot of different ways. Um, so it, it's for me, it's just educating people as much as you can. Is it going to stop it? No. <laughs> but I think we, we have to still continue to try to put those things out there for people to understand the, the, the seriousness to uh, the trash issue that we have. Or, or is it advocating for a bigger penalty? I mean, when you think about it, there's been illegal dumping, especially chemicals and things for, you know, since they've started making them, but the penalties aren't big enough to make people stop doing it. If you're making money by dumping it and, oh, here's a $250 fine. That's all right. I just made six grand, you know, so I'll take it. That's just a cost of doing business. Now, if all of a sudden they take my truck away, oh, that's a whole different situation. Yeah, we we had a situation just like Ron was um saying with, um, we had a park that was had basketball goals, which are probably the most highly used in the city. And people could just drive back there, park, and it was kind of off the beaten path. A lot of stuff that was shouldn't be going on in parks was going on. Um, so we always had issues there, always illegal dumping. One day we found a whole uh, trailer full of stuff back there. Uh, lo and behold, uh, right up the street, a house was being renovated. We went through the stuff. I had my park staff. I said, let's find something in here. We found receipts from the people who were doing the renovating. So we called the police and said, here's the guy who just did this illegal dumping, took pictures and everything. The police didn't do anything. So my director at the time said, you know what? We're going to fix this. We put a daggum gate up at the entrance and said, you know what? If you can't do this, the people who are back here playing basketball or whatever, you're going to have to walk now. So We've done that in a lot of our parks. And I know that it's not the people playing basketball that are doing it, but to help our park staff. Now we have keys to the gates. They can go back there, empty the trash. But I always tell them when you open the gate, make sure you just dummy lock it behind you. Otherwise, you're going to have to deal with people back there. So we started putting up gates at the entrances to our parks. The people have to walk to do the activities. But I was just tired of my staff having to clean up trash when they didn't need to. I you know people just doing stuff that, they shouldn't be doing. Um, and it's actually helped in a couple of our parks. We get complaints a little bit, but I'm like, you know what? It's a park. You're supposed to be getting exercise. You can't walk an extra 50 feet or 100 feet. And once we explain to them what's going on, they're like, oh, OK, we understand totally. We're just trying to keep everything nice and clean, you know. So and I'm sure that's in a lot of places you don't have that option. But we were lucky in a couple of places to, hey, well, let's just put a gate up and, and it worked. So. Um, very fortunate, I guess. Other other experiences with managing that waste, either illegal or just your, I mean, what are you doing within your public spaces? Are you also responsible for your main street areas in front of city hall, those kind of things, you know, and is that something that has to build into that thought process or is that something that people just say we just need another trash can there you know is that the answer just put more trash cans trash cans everywhere oh well, we um we actually changed the philosophy we actually built a park um or renovated a park four years ago um it was in the worst part of the city i mean gun violence shootings gangs the whole nine yards and people were going crazy why are you redoing this park there's shootings over here all the time we said, because it's next on our list, this neighborhood needs the renovated park. Um, we tore it down, built a brand new playground, and almost from the day it opened, very little violence going on. So our philosophy was, we're going to build something new. We're going to make it real nice. 
and people are going to stop doing things they shouldn't do. So the same thing with trash cans. We've started at the end of the fiscal year getting these brand new, really nice trash cans that we build, put together. They look really nice in your park. And it seems like the places that we put them, we don't have issues. It's almost like put nice stuff out here. People are like, oh, this is really nice. You know, it's here for a reason. I'm going to use it. Obviously, it doesn't work all the time. But if you put nice stuff out there, you build nice things, it seems to help. Um, obviously, we can't do that everywhere with budgets and everything. But every chance we've had an opportunity to do that, we've tried. And it seems to have helped a lot. Yeah, I, I agree. And in, uh, in Baltimore City, we, we have several um, parks that are, you know, in some uh, really challenging areas. But, uh, you know, in our bills, we, we want to always make sure that we've been, you know, inclusive, no matter where the park is. Um, so, you know, I, I agree. You know, when we do build nice things, um, it changes how that neighborhood sees itself. You know, if you don't care, then of course the people in that neighborhood are not going to care about what's happening in their surrounding neighborhood. So we we have to make sure that we are, um, you know, always putting things towards the neighborhoods that don't get, don't have the money and don't have the prestige and don't have, you know, the things that they need just so they can have a nice neighborhood or a nice safe place for their kids to play. And that should be for everybody, you know. So, um, you know, and that's one of our challenges that we have. You know, we're doing all these one, wonderful and fantastic bills in Baltimore City. And, you know, I, I built them and a week later, you know, they went out and burnt it down. Entire playground, just set it on fire. Unbelievable. But, you know, we, we had to go back and luckily it was still under insurance and we built it right back up again. So. We, we can't let those things stop us from, you know, continue to do great things out here, like all of us are doing. And we, we're going to have the challenges. It, it just come with the territory. It's, go, it's going to be there. It's just, be, you know, being creative in, in how we are getting things done. Absolutely. We had a park that we built in 2017, and it was – I wouldn't say overrun, but we had a lot of homeless people who lived there in the park and lived under the shelters. And we built a brand new playground. And all of a sudden, people were coming left and right down to the playground and using the shelter and on the water. And miraculously, the homeless people disappeared. They didn't want to be around all the people that were there and all the kids playing. And, you know, that's just one way you, you take care of that. And it, you don't, you're not running the homeless people off, but they don't want to be around a lot of people. So, you know. It, it killed two birds at one stone. Well, I'm curious in our last little bit here, this brings up a, an important example of some things I've been seeing in research where around parks and green infrastructure and gentrification. You know, I mean, we're, we're putting these great things in, we're doing good work, but is that just transitioning and moving things is that just saying well that neighborhood has now moved over to a different part of town and or are we actually impacting our communities and bringing everyone into the fold and so i'm curious what are some of the efforts you've seen to make sure that all stakeholders are involved in that kind of level you know how are we making it sustainable for the broader community and, you know, more than just, okay, this area is nice now, the rent just went up, everybody moves. I, I think from the, you know, from the beginning, what we do in the city before we do any bill, our first thing is to talk with the people in the community and see what it is they want. Talk, have, you know, meet with the kids, the teenagers, the adults and see exactly what it is they want because I don't live in that neighborhood. So I don't, I, we just don't go build things in people's neighborhood. We bring everybody together, get everybody's opinions, you know, had the kids writing on, you know, different boards or whether they want slides or swings or all different kinds of apparatuses and climbing things. So we make sure that we are, uh, 
you know, their opinions matter and that the things that they want to see in their playgrounds that they get. Uh, are they going to get everything? No. <laughs> but we try to try to, you know, bring it as close as possible to, uh, you know, what they want and what they want to see and just make sure that they are included in those discussions from the beginning all the way through to the end, to the conception of it. So I, I think it's important to, you know, if you want the the a buy-in from the people in the community, you have to get them involved from the beginning, not after decisions have been made and all that kind of stuff. That's too late. They don't want, they, they're mad at that point. They don't want to be involved at that point. So before pen is to paper, have that discussion with the people in that community. And you are you going to get, is everybody going to buy in? No. Is everybody going to be happy about everything? No. Are you going to have people in the, just going back and forth with things that, yes, but that's part of the process. So, um, you know, I would say that, you know, have, have them involved from the beginning. It, it, it makes a huge difference. And get the, the, the council people in your districts. If you can get them involved and get them going and helping them with promoting what, what's, what's going on in the neighborhood, that's, that's important too, from the beginning. <laughs> I want to throw a question at that. I mean, I definitely don't want to discount that, but are those folks also involved in discussing what it takes to maintain and keep those things that they want? I guess that's where that's where I see a bit of disconnect. And I'm wondering how you folks manage that. And, you know, we do a lot of this community engagement and think about build, build, build. Now we have it. Ribbon's been cut. What does it take to keep, keep, keep? You know, like, are we doing that at the upfront as well? Or it's OK, well, here's the keys. OK, now what? Deer in headlights and the community's gone. And then we always say, well, the community is so needed to have us keep this nice, but they don't know what it takes to keep it nice. That's that's a perfect point, BK, because over the years, we, we from 2016 to 19, we built renovated playgrounds and we did four of them in a four year span. And we one of the big aspects was the um, scenery around trees, shrubs, bushes, all sorts of stuff. We spent thousands of dollars on beautifying the area is an absolute maintenance nightmare. And my crew right now is building entrance signs to our athletic complexes. So instead of putting all these nice shrubbery and everything in there that is a maintenance nightmare, they're like, hey, can we just put grass? Can we sod this and put grass so we can just mow it and maintain it? And it looks amazing. And so we've started taking out shrubs and bushes and stuff that are a maintenance nightmare and just simply putting nice green plush grass and it looks so clean. It looks so nice. And I haven't had one person complain, hey, where's this bush? Where's this shrub? And so that's the plan going forward is making it look nice and clean. And we're redoing a park right now close to where our offices is. And instead of building all these shrubs and everything in my master plan, I've got like four trees. And that's it. You know, four well-placed trees that are going to grow up that aren't going to be a maintenance nightmare, but it's just green space, playgrounds and swings for the kids, a shelter for the parents, a walking path. And that's it. Um, you know, so I, I, we've learned over the years that less is more sometimes. Keep it simple. Yes. Yeah. You don't want to cookie cutter it too much, too, going back to the point of it. It definitely right. makes a difference of what that immediate community wants. But we need to, I guess, educate the community of, OK, that's what you want. But now this is what it takes. And sometimes maybe that's on us to actually spend the time to figure out this is what it takes to make it to this level. Because you know, um, we're a very reactive industry especially on the park side of parks and recreation recreation is very very much reactive too we're quick on our feet we can roll with punches we you know it's the type of people we are but at the end of the day when we start griping we can't actually put our finger on how much we do when how we do it's like ah that should only take you four hours 
well, I can do it in two. Well, I can do it in three. I can do it in six. You know, that's because you sleep in the truck for two before you go out and work. You know, so like you got to have a standard to be able to call everybody equal. Otherwise, you say, well, he's not a good worker. What are you basing that on compared to you, compared to him, compared to the guy down the street? You know, um, and for sustainability of our industry, we need to start thinking about what are we expecting from an, a younger generation that may not have the experience that we grew up with. You know, if there's sometimes when I have miscommunication challenges, I have to go back and say, well, am I saying it the right way or am I breaking it down to a point that I'm not making it too simple? But does somebody actually know what I'm talking about? Otherwise, it just not everybody's going to admit, hey, I don't know what the hell you're saying. That's a skill that's taking something. So that, that's what we need to do as an industry and start thinking of what are we doing every day? Is it something we need to do every day? Or are we just doing it because it's the way we've always done it? Why are we doing this? Why are we filling out this form? Does anyone actually read this form? You know, so those are some of those hard conversations that we need to really look at. And if it's something we have no control over, then sure. Okay. But if it is something we have control over, which is a lot more than we want to admit. I see a lot of nods on that one. <laughs> uh, going back to the, uh, the uh, maintenance on uh, I guess over overdoing like uh, when these landscape engineers design new parks with all this landscape material. Um, I, I understand that the more plants they sell, the more money they'll make. But I don't think our leaders look at the cost that it, it and the time it takes to maintain these beautiful parks or playgrounds that they design. Um, and another example is one of our main parks in the borough we just built a big gazebo and they're talking about building a, a bathhouse a waste waste room for uh the uh park park area near the new pavilion um i wonder if they're considering who's going to maintain that on the weekends a, a beautiful weekend is going to get a lot of use it's going to get dirty are they going to pay us overtime to come in on weekends or are they going to hire part-time employees to, to maintain the facilities during the weekend. I don't know if that's something that they've even considered. Um, I hopefully that's something that they, they thought about before they go ahead and purchase uh, a bathhouse, but I guess time will tell. And the bigger question be, is there plumbing there? Oh, yeah, we face the same, we face the exact <laughs> same thing. We have, we have counselors who in there, they have a park that just was renovated and they're um, in their ward. And they're like, we need a bathroom. We're like, this is a community park. This is not a citywide park. You don't need a full bathroom. So we just put porta johns in all the little community parks, you know, because building a big one, you're exactly right. Someone's got to maintain it. We have them where we have athletic fields and stuff, but you know, they keep fighting this fight. And we're like, this is this, is, we're not gonna build bathrooms in all of our parks. That's ridiculous. The plumbing cost, the it all adds up water. The whole nine yards and then taking care of it is a whole new issue just like you said you know yeah overtime weekend someone there on the weekend uh yeah absolutely open and, and toilet tissue and and all that it's it's not cheap yeah well you know and it, going on that point you need to kind of break that down and say hey this is what it would cost you maintaining that over this because it takes you know at least three hours of time for a laborer to do that and then if it is outside of their normal work time that's what at least double time right so they have all these different kind of things that come into account maybe they'll say yeah porter johns are the way to go and then somebody comes in with a power washer and let somebody else take care of it right yep interesting well we are at 1 30 here on my clock so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat. Um, we will be having uh, one, no, two more roundtables this year. So I'll have one around September if I'm looking at it. No, August. So August we'll be discussing 
uh, deferred maintenance. Are you keeping track of it? What does it mean? And so uh, that's the main focus for our next one. And then our last one will be December, just kind of rounding up the year and looking at 2024. Sounds good. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you, you for playing along and uh, we'll see you in the future. Sounds Thanks. good. Bye-bye.